The next uh, presentation is by Professor John Stewart from UCLA. John was in charge of a working group, large working group on site response uh, and site database. Very important uh, working group. John, welcome. Okay, uh, good morning. Um, I'm going to be essentially making two presentations. Uh, one on the site database, which Tim mentioned, and then a second one on the site amplification issues that Yusuf mentioned. So we'll start with the site database. Um, I'm going to essentially talk about three things. Um, what is the role of the site database within the broader data collection project? How does it feed into the flat file? And what are the principal contents of it? There's actually a lot more information in the site database than there is uh, site information in the flat file. Uh, and so I'll explain what's all in there. And incidentally, this database will be made available, I believe, at the same time the flat file will, so that you can look it up. I'll talk about VS30 terms. Uh, if anyone's unfamiliar, VS30 is the time averaged shear wave velocity in the upper 30 meters of the site. Um, and uh, it was one of the major data collection efforts that we had. So most of the talk will actually be on that. And then I'll give an overview of the site data. Okay, so the role and the contents of the uh, site database in the project. Well, essentially what the site database was, was it's the repository for everything related to the site conditions at the sites that produced recordings. So uh, there is one row in the site database per site. So if a site has produced 20 recordings, it only appears once for us. Okay, so those multiple recordings then get reflected later on in the flat file. Anytime something changed in terms of our knowledge of site information of the site, it was got put into the site database. And then periodically, uh, Tim and Chetta developed routines to import all that information. So there would be periodic um, updates of the flat file based on the site database. But the site database was where the changes happened. The contents of the database, I break into a few categories. There is, first of all, basic information on the stations. Uh, there are identifying numbers. We have what we call station sequence number, which we use internally, one per site. There are also numbers that the data providers have assigned for their stations. Uh, the name of the station, um, as Tim mentioned, we spent a lot of time just going through bookkeeping issues. The, the same site might have been listed with four or five different names. And so we essentially adopted the most descriptive name and uh, tossed all the rest. Geodetic coordinates, that's, that's latitude and longitude, and we're reporting it to as many significant digits uh, as we can. Um, in many cases, there is more precise locations than we had in NGA West 1. And station housing. So this would be essentially codes, the geometrics first letter that would indicate uh, a free field hut uh, at the bottom of a small building on the abutment of a dam and, and so on. Records that are literally in buildings, in the upper levels of buildings, I should say, say on the roof of a building, are not in the database. It, or if they are, then we missed it. Okay, so our intent was not to provide every ground motion that's ever been recorded. But we do have records in buildings at that lowest level. And it's up to individual GMP developers to decide if they want to consider that record or not uh, in their analysis. We have VS30 for measurements. And um, I'll tell you that um, we're at about uh, 25, 30 percent, something like that, of our stations have velocities for measurements, which is comparable to the percentage we had before. Uh, but we have a lot more stations than before. So in fact, there are a lot more VS30s from measurements now than there was before. Now, data in the site database connected with VS30 from measurements uh, includes the profile depth. This um, is important because oftentimes the profiles are shallower than 30 meters. When they're shallower than 30 meters, we have a column called VSZ, Z being the depth, and so if, for example, you have a profile 15 meters deep, that would be VS15. And what that is is the time average shear wave velocity to 15 meters. That is the data. And we want to have the data reflected in the database. 
Now, as part of our project, we looked into various articles in the literature and research that's been done on how accurately can we extrapolate from, for example, VS15 to VS30. And it turns out you can extrapolate pretty well. There's not much error, there's not much sigma associated with that extrapolation. Although the, t the way you do the extrapolation is a little different in different regions because there are sort of regional variations in crustal gradients, velocity gradients, uh, and you need to take that into account. So we've reviewed all that stuff. We have applied different protocols for extrapolation in different parts of the world. And when we have Z less than 30, we are providing an extrapolated VS30. We also provide the source of the data. So uh, where did the profile come from, basically, that, were, that was used to calculate either VSZ or VS30? Now, I mentioned about, say, a quarter to maybe 30% of the sites have velocities from measurements. Virtually all the sites have velocities. So where did the other, say, 70% come from? Um, well, they come from what we're calling proxies. And we spent a lot of time trying to make the process of going from a proxy to a VS30 uh, clear. We wanted it to be clear and defensible and um, not based on sort of vague judgment that somebody had at some point in time. So everything is very well defined and uh, documented. The proxies that we've included are here. So we have what I call a, geo a set of geotechnical categories. They're the geometrics third letters. They go from A which would be rock, uh, fairly firm rock, up through E, which would be soft soil. So that's there. We have surface geology. Uh, and since NGA West 1, there's been an update in the uh, California surface geology-based VS30 estimation in which surface geology is combined with slope measured on a 10 arc second uh, grid. Uh, and this is work out of the California Geological Survey, Chris Wills and Carlos Gutierrez. And I want to uh, acknowledge and thank Chris and Carlos because they were a huge help in helping us to look up the surface geology and the slope. And I should mention the slope is, is basically used only for the quaternary sites. Other than that, it's just uh, geology uh, categories. And there's a VS30 for each one. Um, 30 Arc second slope, so that's a separate slope parameter at a coarser grid. Uh, we've compiled that as well. Uh, Dave Wald and his colleagues uh, have been working on this uh, as a proxy. So you basically take the slope and you get a VS30 from it. Um, you cannot currently go to Dave Wald's website and get the slope directly. Uh, and so there again, we work directly with Dave and his staff to, to query his source database, his digital elevation model, to get the slopes for all the sites. And so for basically every site, there might be a couple that we missed here and there, but basically every site we have the actual slope. Um, there's a terrain trite proxy, uh, proxy. So this is a, a category scheme. There's 19 categories describing different types of terrain. It's available worldwide. It's actually based on the same 30 arc second uh, digital elevation models that Dave Wald used. And so we have that for a number of areas. We haven't actually done that for every place around the world, but we have it for many. And uh, we have elevations, because that's a proxy used uh, in Taiwan. So I, before I move on from that, I do just want to emphasize this was a, a big emphasis for us. What we basically had before was the VS30 that came out from these proxies. We didn't have the proxies themselves in many cases. So we've populated the database with the proxies. So if the correlation in the future were to change, for example, from slope to VS30, you've got the slope. And then you just apply the new correlation, and you can update your proxy. Um, with the help of... Uh, Folks from the USGS and others, we have updated depth parameters. These are basin depths, so we basically have that for the San Francisco Bay Area, uh, Southern California, and Japan. And you can see here the sources. So Brad Agart, uh, we were using his latest models uh, for Northern California. Z1 is the depth to the one kilometer per second shear wave isosurface, and then we have one and a half and two and a half as well. Southern California depths. And uh, we also were able to get, with the help of uh, Tadahiro Kishida and our colleagues in Japan, um, some depth parameters uh, from Japan. Other than that, depth is actually still missing in the database. So there's plenty of sites that don't have depth. 
Okay, now talking about the VS30 terms, VS30 from data. As I mentioned before, we looked at alternate uh, models for extrapolating from VSZ to VS30. Um, essentially, there's a California model that Dave Bohr published in um, 2004. There's an updated model that he published, uh, I think, just last year based on data from Japan. Uh, and then there's a model, an unpublished model, that uh, Walt Silva and his colleagues have done for China. And so all these were looked at, and we have VS30 is extrapolated from VSZ by the different models in the um, site database. And we made a judgment with group consensus about which was going to be the best one to use uh, for the uh, preferred VS30 for any, each given site. We have assigned um, uncertainties to all of our velocities. Uh, in the case of measured velocities, um, after a lot of discussion, uh, essentially looking at, at dense sets of velocities um, measured at a given site and how variable the VS30s are, uh, we've essentially arrived at a log sigma of 0.1 when we have a measurement that goes 30 meters. When the um, measurement is uh, shallower than 30 meters, you're going to get a higher standard deviation, and the standard deviation will climb um, the uh, shallower the measurement. This is just an example of the extrapolation technique. So this is VS30 on the Y, VSZ on the X, and you can see, um, you know, this is the cluster of data, basically, that we have and a couple of the different extrapolation models that were considered. VS30 from proxy, we only use this when we uh, don't have measurements. Now, we actually populate the database, even when we have measurements, for the purpose of evaluating the proxies. But in the end, the value that gets passed on to Tim is based on measurements when we have measurements. If we don't have measurements, we use the proxies. We went through and analyzed the proxy. So we used the data that we collected uh, and other data to basically look at how accurate proxies uh, that, that we have um, are. How effectively can they predict uh, VS30? And so we did that by taking sites where we have estimates from the proxies and we have measurements. And we take the difference of the logs, VS30 from measurement, VS30 from proxy. We look at histograms like this. And we're looking for a proxy, a well-performing proxy, to have a zero mean and a small sigma. And it should be doing that across various types of site conditions, in this case, quaternary alluvium and tertiary. If you compile that type of information over lots of different um, types of proxies and different site conditions, this is uh, geometric's third letter, uh, this is um, third letter plus elevation, a couple others here. We want to see, uh, on average, a zero mean and the smallest possible sigma. So I'm not going to go through the details of the results because we don't have time. Uh, but we made some judgments about which proxies are performing better, which ones are performing worse. And we essentially weighted our estimates of the VS30 on the basis of these, this performance, okay, which is what this says here. The database indicates which proxies were used for each individual site and provides an explanation for how the weighted averages and sigmas were computed. Overview of the data, uh, there are currently 4,160 sites. About 1,000 of those are the small magnitude data set that Tim mentioned. Uh, for comparison, there were about 1,600 in the original NGA. Geographical distribution of the sites. Um, this is the original NGA project. So the green here is mostly California, and there was a lot of Taiwan, and then various other places. Uh, in the current database, uh, still a lot of California, uh, still a lot of Taiwan, but you see now a lot of Japan sites have come in. So that's a big change. Also China, uh, and then the various other places. So one of the biggest changes just geographically is Japan is a major contributor to the data set now, and it really was not much of a contributor before. Uh, in terms of availability of proxies at all the sites, we have Geomatrix third letter for most of them, about 80%. We have surface geology mostly in California. We're going to be looking to expand that over time, but for now, we pretty much have it for, for about 35% of the sites. We have slope virtually everywhere, and the few that we're missing, it's probably because we don't know the lat longe very well. Because anywhere you have a lat longe, you can get a slope. Um, in terms of VS30s for measurements versus proxies, uh, this graphic, I think, pretty much tells the story. So what you're looking at here, oops, sorry. Uh, what you're looking at here is uh, histograms of the inferred VS30s, the, the white lines up here. 
and measured below. This is VS30 um, down here. This is original NGA project, current NGA project. And um, while there are probably roughly um, comparable percentages of rock versus soil sites now as opposed to then, because the number of sites is so much greater, there's actually a lot more rock sites. So in answer to one of the gentleman's questions out here, um, proportionately, yeah, not much change, but in, in raw numbers, there's a lot more rock sites. And that has some significant implications, actually. There's also more soft soil sites. And so I think we can get some good insights at both limits of the velocity range. You'll see more on that as we go through the day. So this concludes my site database uh, presentation. Uh, since the second part of my talk is quite different in content, I thought I'd take any questions now if there are any. Uh, John, uh, about the station information, uh, you mentioned uh, housing. Um, how about other factors? For example, if a station is on the top of a hill, like Tarzana record, or if a free field station is close to a tall building. Uh, in California, we have been more careful about this type of conditions, but some of the sites in uh, other countries, I think we have this problem. You're right. So there's, there's a couple of questions embedded in there. Okay. So one of them is, I'll take the last one first. Uh, what about all these stations in other countries? Maybe we don't have this information. And you're right. So we don't have the geometrix first letter, which is what carries this housing information everywhere. We are pretty complete in California. Uh, we have sort of General knowledge, you know, uh, we know that they intended to put it in certain places and a lot, you know, I've gone and seen a lot of sites in Japan, but by no means the thousands of sites that they have. So uh, I, I have a sense that, you know, they predominantly do, in fact, have free field stations, for example, in Japan. In Taiwan, they have a lot of stations in schools, which are short buildings. But we don't have that specific information on a site-by-site -site basis. Okay, so the developers are, for the most part, just assuming that they're free field, even though we don't have it uh, for these foreign stations. Now, on the first question, uh, you asked about uh, topography. So we, we have uh, not really a direct indicator of topography. We have things like dam abutments, but, but we don't have like a metric of topography as a site parameter. Um, if a good metric could be identified over the course of research and can be Express, say, from digital elevation models, that could be something we could do in NJ West 3. <laughs> I think it's been discussed. Yeah, I wanted to say that uh, in the next phase, uh, we are really hoping one issue is the issue of topography. Yeah. Uh, how we are going to incorporate that into GMP and so on. That's another uh, way yeah. of doing it. And then another. Uh, it's Mike. No, no, it's Mike. There is a Mike. Or, sorry. Uh, the other thing is that since really this is community-based project, it's not one individual project, many of people who are working on various pieces, they know about the, these earthquakes. Either they have visited and so on. One good question, they are uh, Italian earthquakes, right? And uh, because they found out that there's uh, maybe in the castle, their instrument is in castle and so on. But John, for example, visited the, that earthquake and so on, and we have lots of contacts uh, uh, from Italy. So that process helped us a lot, that screening, that, oh, this is in the castle. They, oh, this is in the slope because they wanted to do whatever. So that was one reason of screening was time concern. I have a few questions from the internet. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Vladimir Grazer is asking, can you please specify name uh, some of the high... S-wave velocity sites, where are they? California, China, Japan? Um, most of the added high velocity sites are California. Um, so one in particular is Diablo Canyon, which is added a couple weeks ago. <laughs> and it's a, very, it's a pretty fast velocity. So a lot of them came in through the small magnitude database Tim mentioned. Another question from Larry Salomon, and he's asking, did you record the depth of the sensors at the recording stations? Are you even, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the depth directly is a parameter, uh, no, but we have geometrics first letter codes that reflect that. So there are, for example, some records that are 
Uh, some instruments that are in vaults, which are fairly shallow, say two meters or less. We have others in tunnels. Um, so there is information on that, but there isn't like a Z parameter that says the depth below the ground surface. But then, just to clarify, you didn't use like the downhole arrays of the kick net, for example. You used um, surface, no. right? No. So, so okay. downhole array data uh, was in NGA West 1. I think we've actually purged most of that out and just are keeping the surface. That's it. Okay. And one quick question um, back here. Uh, you talked about using, I guess, shallower depth shear weight velocity measurements for your, and then kicking those out to be a VS30. How shallow did you allow the measurements to be before you might shift to a proxy instead? Um, I, as a practical matter, we went about as shallow as around 10 or 12 meters. Okay. Um, the, the prox these extrapolation techniques do go shallower still, but again, as a practical matter, I don't think we had too many velocity profiles that were shallower than that, so. Okay. I think maybe just one more, then we should move on because there's still a lot to do in the second. <laughs> uh, Jonathan, a lot of um, structures are going to have basements. Has anybody looked at the relationship between these surface concrete pads for free field and what recordings are in the basements of buildings that are at greater depth? Sure. I've done a lot of work on that. Um, so. That's a soil structure interaction effect. What is the difference between free field and um, foundations with different configurations, including basements? Um, I'd be happy to take it up with you at the break. As far as the database is concerned, that's essentially reflected through the geometrics first letter. So there are general descriptors that indicate whether it's in a basement, what is the approximate size of the structure. Um, so if, if it's OK, I'd yeah. like to move on, because we still got a long way to go. <laughs> The main event, I think, is still ahead. So um, the second presentation I'd like to give is nonlinear site response um, and revisions to the near site factors. And um, as Yusuf mentioned, uh, we undertook this task as both a technical task and as a consensus building process. It started um, over two years ago, in fact, two and a half years ago about. Um, Amel Sehan is the graduate student who uh, was right in the thick of it from the beginning, and she's here. And you see um, all the participants. The participants uh, in this task were there because of their expertise in site response, uh, and also their expertise in many cases with the code, the building code, where it came from, how to get things through the, uh, the review uh, process for, for the code. And so, there's, there's both technical and, uh, and code-like expertise here. What I'll talk about is uh, context. So the point here is for anybody who is not a practicing engineer, uh, and you're not really sure why we're worried about this stuff, I'm going to just briefly describe uh, how ground motions are developed in the code and how these site factors are used. We'll talk about where they came from, the site factors and the NEHER provisions. I'll also tell you what the NEHER provisions are, <laughs> if you're not familiar. Uh, we'll talk about the site factors that were developed as part of our group activities. So we did develop a model for site amplification, which I'll show you. And then uh, from that model, we developed recommendations for the near factors. And then we'll have some conclusions. Um, in terms of context, of course, we, I think most of us know that the building code provides a simplified basis for coming up with ground motions for use in engineering design. Uh, basically, it starts with ground motions on rock uh, that are mapped. They're mapped by the USGS, and this is what the NGA ground motion equations are going to be used to develop along with uh, various source models. So the USGS maps at a certain uh, set of return periods the ground motions for rock site conditions, and this is one such map, hotter colors indicating stronger motions. In particular, for the design of buildings, the most important parameters are S sub S, that's a spectral acceleration for short periods, about 0.2 seconds, and S sub 1 spectral acceleration for mid periods, one second. These are the mapped parameters. Those parameters um, are then modified through site factors. Okay, so you go and you, by one means or another, you come up with a VS30 for your site, and on the basis of that, you divide 
uh, the world into five categories, A through E, A being rock-like and E being the softest soil. Um, and you basically as assign a factor, FA for the short periods, FV for the long periods. And I'll talk more about these later. The uh, S sub S is multiplied by the F sub A. So the short period rock spectral acceleration times F sub A forms this short period uh, spectral acceleration for the site condition. Same thing for the mid periods. These are combined with some rules for constructing the shape of the spectrum, which I won't really go through here, but you basically end up with a spectrum that looks something like this, defined on the basis of these two parameters. So this is what we're talking about. Now, where do these site factors come from in the NEHER provisions? Well, first of all, what are the NEHER provisions? Well, NEHER is the National Earthquake Hazards Reduction Program. It's an act of Congress, which did a lot of things, but among them was to establish a process by which new science, new technology would be brought into the code writing process. That's done through the NEHER provisions and the associated commentary, and it's been that way for many years, well over 20 years. So new ideas basically come in through the NERP provisions. It's not necessarily in code language, so from there, over the last few cycles, it goes into something called ASCE 7. That's getting it closer to code language. Uh, there's an additional set of reviews, of course, that happens there, but it's a little less technical. Um, and then finally, you end up with the building code, in this case, the IBC, but there are other codes used in various places around the country. Okay, so basically, the starting, the, the front end of the process is the NEHRP. And uh, we talk about the NEHRP factors, or sometimes you'll see the ASCE factors because of the ASC7 uh, document. Now, the factors FA and FV that I referred to before, they're derived for VS30 based site categories. So that was a decision that was made about 20 years ago. We're not going to use rock and soil anymore, or rock and soil and soft soil. We're going to define site categories on the basis of VS30. And this is, this is held up well over time for the most part. These are the factors again. I'll just point out a few things here that I didn't say before. There's the five categories, uh, E being softest, A being hardest. If you look, uh, these are the um, levels of motion on rock, S1, SS. At the far um, left end, this would be fairly weak input, and you see, as you would expect, soft soil has higher amplification uh, than stiffer soil and rock. So that's one trend that you see. Another one that you see is, see how the, the amplification decreases as you go to stronger shaking? That is nonlinearity in the site amplification. The level of nonlinearity, essentially the slope, is a lot steeper for E than it is for D or C and so on. So there's more nonlinearity for softer soils. Again, no big surprise there. The factors contain that intuitive trend. I'm trying to get the cursor back here. There it is. Um, and then the other... Uh, the point that I would make is that this slope is steeper at short periods than it is at long periods. So there's varying levels of nonlinearity depending on what spectral period. All of these are intuitive, reasonable trends. Okay? And those basic features are being retained as we go along. Now an important detail, we'll talk quite a bit about this, is that these factors are combined with the USGS maps. And those maps are defined in modern times for a very specific site condition, which is 760 meters per second. So in the original NGA models, when USGS developed the maps, they plugged in a number for VS30. And that number was 760. Now, a little bit of background on how these came to be. They were developed in 1992, and of course some work before that. Uh, there was a workshop then uh, that, that brought forth these provisions, um, brought forth some recommendations, and they were adopted for the first time in the 94 near provisions. It's important to remember what the national maps looked like in those days. The national maps were based on, or were published by a fellow named Alger Misson at the USGS, and they were based on a GMPE. Now, the GMPE that was used for the Western US in those days was by Schnabel and Seed, published in 1973. This is the header of their paper, in BSSA. And the GMPE was, they did the best they could with the very limited data that they had at the time. They used rock records, and for soil records, they deconvolved the motions down to rock. So that at the end of the day, all of the records they were using were intended to be for rock, 
Okay, so this was not GMPs as we know them now, which apply for all the different site conditions. This was a GMPE for rock. So then you can say, well, what kind of rock were they looking at? Well, they probably didn't know it at the time, but the rock records they were using were probably on average around 600 meters per second VS30. We kind of know that's a reasonable average in California these days. If you go back to the 1970s reports and see what did they deconvolve to, what was the velocity they were going down to, it was quite a bit stiffer, about 2,400 meters per second. One way or another, uh, what Seed and, and Schnabel came up with, they report as being for 11,000 feet per second, which is 3,400 meters per second. So the numbers don't exactly all line up, but that was the velocity that was intended uh, to be representative of these GMPEs at that time. They were used by Aldermisson to create the maps. This is a scan of the California portion of the map from 1990. The uh, documentation describes it as being useful for this velocity range. This is not VS30, this is just velocity. It's probably a surface velocity. VS30 would probably be a little bit higher. Um, so basically, it's a, it's a ground motion map for a firm rock condition. Obviously, the numbers are kind of varying around a little bit, but I think they're all pointing towards this is a pretty firm rock condition. And so that was what the mindset was. That's what people were looking at at the time the Neher factors were developed. Now, they were developed uh, using uh, data largely from the, well, pretty much from the Loma Prieta earthquake. There was a combination of empirical and um, simulation. I'll describe that. There was empirical weak motion amplification using recordings from the San Francisco Bay Area. The PGA on rock averaged about 0.1 G, so pretty low levels of motion. Uh, this is a map showing the various sites. I won't go through the details. I'll just say that the site amplification was taken from pairs of sites, uh, one on rock, one on soil, and 4A amplitude ratios were computed of the soil at various VS30s over a reference rock, which was pretty firm material, Franciscan type materials. There were 35 such pairs. They were plotted up uh, over average period ranges. Uh, and you can see the data and the regression. Uh, the regression is linear. It looks like this. So there's a reference velocity, which is essentially uh, where this passes through one. There's a slope C. Okay? So that's the linear amplification. Two parameters, both were regressed, and uh, the velocity came out for both F sub A and F sub V to be about 1,050 meters per second. So those lines were used. Committees looked at it. Uh, they came up with uh, sort of various plateaus to use for different site categories, and the factors were defined for that weak motion condition. I won't go through the details, but there was a set of simulations that happened as well. So shake runs and things like that to, to develop nonlinearity and bring that up to stronger input motion levels to produce the factors that we know now. What I would argue uh, is that given what they knew at that time, they had hard rock, basically, ground motion maps. They had uh, side factors that were referenced to similarly hard rock. So everything was compatible. It was perfect. They were using the best available science. They did a good analysis. There was compatibility between the maps and the factors. It was beautiful. It was a great piece of work that got best paper awards and uh, lots of acclaim justifiably. Time went on, and the national maps changed. In 1996, the USGS changed the definition of the reference velocity from whatever Seed and Schnabel had to a very well-defined condition, BC boundary, which is 760 meters per second. So that was intended to be the basis for the 96 maps. The GMPEs weren't completely up to the task yet. Most of them were category-based, rock soil. Bohr had one that was VS30 based, and that was used. Time continued to go on. The maps were updated. The most recent version uh, for the Western US is using NGA uh, with a defined VS30 of 760 meters per second. The factors never changed. So the maps went from hard rock to 760, which is a little bit softer. The factors stayed the same, anchored to 1050. So what did we do in this project? Well, our task, we're called Task 8. Um, our Task 8 committee uh, looked at this. So we plotted up the NGA factors from the original NGA project. We plotted up the um, NEHERB factors 
and we found that there were some differences. So paper was written on this, it was presented at the GEO Congress, maybe some of you saw it. Um, so we basically found some discrepancies. So there was motivation to do something. Um, we decided to develop a site amplification model uh, using the vast NGA West 2 database uh, and site metrics that I spoke about to guide the development of new factors. A proposal was developed on the basis of these factors, which I'll tell you about. And the proposal includes now the factors, just like before, uh, but also an equation. So you can plug in a VS30 and a PGA on rock, or actually an SS or S1 on rock, and get uh, the factors out. So that has been produced. It's actually been looked at by the PUC sort of informally. That's the committee that approves changes to the code, uh, and we'll talk about the process there. Um, there uh, was a dissenting view on what this change should be, and so an alternative proposal has also been put forward, and actually, as we speak, balloting within our committee, Task 8 committee, is going on, uh, is due by tomorrow. For any of you who are on the committee and haven't voted, do so by tomorrow, please. Uh, and then this will be passed along to the PUC. Okay. For developing our model, now this happened a little before the GMPEs that you'll hear about later today. We didn't have the small magnitude data set. We were basically operating off of a July version of the flat file, which didn't have the small magnitude events yet. That 8,600 records, uh, 346 earthquakes. Uh, and we applied some criteria. We used a minimum of 10 records per event so that we could define event terms well. We wanted to um, only use close-in recordings because there's some problems with attenuation at large distance you'll hear more about later. And we omitted records where we didn't know all the information we needed. So here's how we did it. Uh, we took a GMPE for rock conditions. We were actually originally using uh, an interim version of the Campbell and Bezorgnia GMPE. And we basically compute the ground motion we would expect at each site with a recording, but not using the actual VS30 at that site, using 760. Okay, so we expect a mismatch. Okay, so we expect a mismatch. So we compute the residuals in log units, so the difference between the observation and uh, this mu here, there we are, the mu is the median from the interim GMPE, and we add an event term, which is basically the extent to which the earthquake for that event is unusually high or low. Uh, so we basically correct those, those uh, features, which are normal. And then we construct a site amplification model to remove the trends, okay? So we expect a mismatch, so now we're gonna build a model that removes that mismatch from the data. Uh, and we're gonna uh, have a model based on that. So this is what the model looks like. The various models in the GMPEs are gonna look pretty similar to this. Uh, the details will be different. But there's basically, it's in log units. Uh, there's a linear term, which is VS30 scaling. There's a nonlinear term. The linear term uh, has this log VS30 over VREF that we saw earlier with Roger Borchert's original work. And there is a slope term out in front. The difference now is we have a delta C because we do see some regional effects that I'll talk about later. We're setting the reference velocity at 760. Uh, the nonlinear term uh, looks something like this. So this is the most important parameter probably, F2. That is the slope. So as the PGA goes up, the amplification goes down, the slope of that relationship is F2. That's the most important parameter there. Uh, F3 is just an additive parameter so the thing saturates at low ground motion levels. We, set, uh, F3, we looked at things, set F3 to 0.1, F1 we set to um, zero, so for very weak motions there would be no nonlinear term. I have till 10.30, right? 10.20. You can have a little bit more time. You're going to absorb it during lunch. Okay. Yeah, let's finish it. 10.20. 10 I, should, I should finish by 10.20, I think. Um, the steps in model development, pretty standard stuff. Uh, we did the same thing we had done back in the Choi and Stewart article uh, about 10 years ago. So we uh, first evaluate the nonlinearity. Uh, this is guided by both the trends in the data, uh, but also one of the... the Parts of this project that was really useful uh, was a 1D site response simulation program that was run. Uh, I think you'll be hearing about that, right, later in the day, 
Um, and so we were using that. So everybody's collaborating, right? There's all these, we're getting together every month, we're talking about what we're finding. And so we saw some really nice results there and we were able to pull that into our project. So our, the way we express the nonlinearity uh, uses both the data and the simulation results. And I'll show you how that works later. Um, then we basically correct for the nonlinearity. We come up with a site factor that takes away the nonlinearity and the rest is what we're giving to VS30 scaling. And there's some regional effects that come out there. Obviously, we look at residuals at the end to check performance. In the interest of time, I won't be showing all that, but I will talk about these first two steps. So first with the nonlinearity, it's, it's actually conceptually a very simple process. We, we take the data set that we got, we divide it up into bins of VS30. We don't want to stick exactly with the Nihert bins because maybe the boundaries aren't at the best possible places. If you want to see changes in nonlinearity, as you change VS30, you want to divide things up a little bit more tightly. Um, and so there isn't an exact correspondence to Nihert boundaries, for those of you who are familiar with them. But again, this, the point of this was not directly for Nihert, but to build a good model. So we have rock, basically. We have, uh, this is pretty much firm soils to soft rocks, uh, you know, firm soils, uh, getting pretty soft, and then very soft. Should be less than 180, but we're using 200. We see the break and slope occurring at around more like 200. So uh, we then plot the residuals uh, that were computed. This is the difference between the data and the model against PGA. So this is a whole bunch of plots. Let me just, um, maybe we'll look at this one for illustrative purposes. So we have PGA on rock from 0.01 to 0.1 to 1. It's a log scale. Amplification here, here is zero coming across. You see there's amplification for this fairly soft soil. And as you go to larger PGA levels, this is 0.3 seconds by the way, uh, it comes down. So you're getting deamplification out here most of the time, amplification back here. And this is the fit of that curve that I showed you before with the F1, F2, F3. The F, um, the F3, which is the additive term, essentially defines where you get this break and slope. We're using about 0.1G. F2 is the slope out here. Okay, so we're compiling these numbers. And what you basically see is, first of all, as you go from um, short periods to long periods, things get more linear, so these slopes become flatter. And as you go from um, rock sites to, so to uh, softer soil sites, these slopes get steeper. So the slopes are pretty steep here, steep here still, and then getting pretty flat as we go up. Now there's, you know, some outliers. So this is showing a slope, probably not really statistically significant. So you can, of course, run tests on those things and bring that forward. We do the regression, that's the red line. So we had the uh, various parameters. This is the additive term. Uh, D and the slope term B, this is like F2 and this is sort of like F3. All right, so this is the end result of that. Uh, for comparison purposes, I'm also showing the Choi and Stewart model from 2005. So this is the slope applied against VS30. This would be soft soils, kind of soft soils, getting stiffer and so on. There's different regions that were looked at in a bin sense, California, Japan, Taiwan, and we combine everything together, which is probably the most important one to look at, so that's the boxes, okay? And so you can see how the things become more nonlinear as you get to softer soils. We uh, take the results from Ronnie Kamai uh, and uh, her colleagues uh, who provided us the simulation results, which is shown here on the right. So we have amplification versus PGA. And what we're doing basically is we're extracting the slopes out here so that we can plot those up in an apples to apples sense with our slopes. So we plot that up and uh, we basically eyeball it and we build a model. So there's a lot here and I can't walk you through the whole thing, but let me um, try to get the cursor. It would be really nice to have a pointer. <laughs> but these are the boxes from before. Uh, the solid dots, red and blue, are the Kamai slopes, and you can see for PGA, they're generally following similar trends. And basically the orange line here is the model that we have selected. It's not really regressed, it's really based on judgment. There's a 
there's a functional form and we adjust the coefficients to pass through in a way that we think is reasonable. When we get to long periods, things get a little bit dicey. So the data is starting to come down a little bit, even at these long periods. So that's indicating some nonlinearity that we're not sure we really believe. The simulations are not showing that. And so we have model two, which doesn't allow that nonlinearity at the long periods, and model one that does. And we carry that forward uh, through the process. We remove those, that nonlinear factor from the residuals. We plot it against VS30 to, to evaluate VS30 scaling. So this is done for all the data, California, Japan, Taiwan, and these are the slopes. So we're extracting these slopes. And we see that there's variation. So you'll see a lot more about this as we go through the day. But the slopes change with period, and they vary by region. The combined result for all the data is the blue sort of dots here. And uh, you see this trend. Interestingly, Japan uh, is having basically zero slope at short periods. So there's almost no VS30 scaling. But then you get to long period, and it's got quite a bit. And California uh, follows pretty well the overall worldwide trend, which was nice that it turned out that way. So we compile all the slopes, we calculate the delta Cs, and this essentially completes the model. So uh, the way we built near factors from that, well, we talked about it a lot. We met probably three or four times uh, in person. We met other times by phone trying to reach consensus, really, for the most part, on how we're going to go about doing this. What is the pr procedure we're going to use to calculate these factors? Once you agree on a procedure, turning the crank and running the numbers is pretty straightforward. Well, we had a big meeting in June. We agreed on a procedure. We actually held a vote because it had been a contentious issue. Everybody agreed to the procedure I described before. We would use 760 as our reference velocity for computing the side factors. We agreed to not regionalize. Uh, we could have picked California-based factors. Decided not to do that, go with the global model, so delta C was set to zero. Uh, we selected representative velocities within um, the categories A through E. We um, take mean values of the slope parameter F2. Uh, across the period range, because the near factors are not at a specific period. They're averaged across period ranges. So we take um, a mean value across the period ranges um, of these slopes for use in computing FA and FV. The near factors are not expressed relative to PGA. So P the, the driving parameter for the site factors is SSS1. In our model, it's PGA, so we have to convert. Uh, so these are the factors that were used. They do have some magnitude and distance dependence, but these were the numbers that, that we thought made the most sense for the range mostly dominating out here in California. Um, and we use mean values of C across the period ranges. And uh, this is basically what you end up with. If you just casually look at this as compared to the plots I showed at the beginning, they pretty much look the same, but the numbers are shifting around a bit. And let me show you how that works. So these are the factors, FA on top, FV on the bottom, site classes in the different rows, the different um, ground motion levels from weak to strong across the top here. And peer is what we've come up with in task eight. ASCE is the existing factors. Could have just as well called that NEHER. And I pretty much want to draw your attention to uh, a few differences that uh, we felt were significant. First of all, for site class B, Site class B is velocities more than 760, by definition. Now, the VS30 scaling continues on past 760, so you're going to get site amplifications less than 1. So we have numbers that are always less than 1. In fact, they're just about, in fact, they are always 0.9, as it turns out. You go to another significant digit, they're not always the same. But um, uh, PUC wanted only one significant digit past the decimal point. The original factors were always one, and that was, they, that, that was by design. The, the rock maps were thought to be about B, so let's just stick with one. So there's a difference there. If you go to the, the, the soil categories, uh, you see things dropping. So for example, for C, from 1.7 to 1.4. The reason for that change is that we're using 760 as our reference velocity before everything was based on 1050. So if you're referencing to a softer rock condition, the change in ground motion is going to be less. And so we're seeing smaller site factors um, under those conditions. Now, 
there's a lot more than just VS30 scaling in the factors. As you go to stronger ground motion levels, of course, nonlinearity becomes probably the most important factor driving it. They did the best they could back in the 90s. They ran a few shake runs and things like that. Now we have all of Ronnie's results. We have empirical data analysis, and we have the model that produces different levels of nonlinearity, generally less nonlinearity than was present in the early 90s. As a result of less nonlinearity, even though the factors would come down because of the change in reference velocity, they actually end up going up because of the reduction in nonlinearity, if you can follow that. So there are a few cases uh, like this where things are moving in the other direction. They're moving up. And finally, um, things are changing the most for site class E. The factors I just described contribute to that. There's different levels of nonlinearity. There's different reference velocities. But probably the, the biggest reason E is changing is that E had been conservatively bounded to be fairly high within the range of observations before. And now these are uh, median estimates for that site class. So this was put forward to the PUC along with equations I'm not showing. Uh, informally, just to get their reaction. Again, the PUC is called the Provisions Update Committee. It's the committee, mostly structural engineers, who basically review and approve changes to the code. They looked at it. They thought it looked good. They said, give us a formal proposal. Okay, so we've prepared that proposal. It's out for balloting. Uh, one of our committee members did not agree uh, with the approach that was taken. And I'll try to uh, summarize the alternative proposal on its basis here. So in this alternative proposal, the reference condition is said uh, we want to stick with class B. Class B is what was found in the Lone Prater earthquake. It's rock. We should stick with class B. Uh, don't use 760. And a pretty good velocity that's representative of class B is 1050. So under this proposal, we stick with 1050 meters per second as the reference velocity. So site amplification is taken from 1050 to whatever you've got, say 300 or something. The way that the proposal was developed, um, my student, Emil Sehan, um, computed um, site factors from the original NGA models, uh, not necessarily relative to the reference condition they used, because they used different numbers, right? Some were 760, some were 1130, different numbers. Renormalize everything to 1050. She did this for 760 as well, but in this case, normalizing it to 1050, compare that to Neher. And uh, where you see differences, then adjust the numbers to make it match. That's basically what was done under the alternative proposal. And so that has also been prepared and is out for balloting. Um, and once the votes are in, uh, which supposedly will happen tomorrow, C.B. Krause is shepherding this process, we will uh, send it to the PUC. So last slide. VS30 remains the baseline site parameter we're using in NGA. Uh, the NGA models are going to have nonlinear VS30-based site terms. The nonlinearity is driven both by data and by simulations. Different groups will use different approaches. There's going to be some regionalization in the VS30 scaling. Haven't talked about why that is. We'll do that later, because I know I'm running over. Um, and um, pending changes to the site factors. The thing we really couldn't ultimately reach consensus on was the reference velocity. Um, I think most people feel that we should use the same value as the map. Some don't. So we had, we had some struggles with that. There was consensus we should use global data, really no disagreement there, and there was consensus that the levels of nonlinearity are less than we had 20 years ago. So I think everybody was in agreement on that as well. Great. Thank you very much, John. I appreciate that. Very important. All right. Uh, we have five minutes for questions. Uh, we are 15 minutes behind, which is okay. We are going to absorb it during the lunch. This was too important to cut. Uh, no, that's okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> questions for John Seward. Okay, why don't we start? We'll see you. So, John, the proposal you are still having the BC boundary for the maps, but applying that to a class B in the factors and then from there go for C, D, E still. So you still have that. The, the majority of the people proposing is still that, if I understand correctly. We, uh, we don't have a site factor that is exactly one. So the, the reference condition is 760. And the, the site factors apply to, to, to the middle of categories. Okay, So 
B goes from 760 to 1500, so we use something around, you know, say 1050 or something. So that's going to be smaller than 1. Now when you go to C, the velocity is, let's say, 500. It's going to be more than 1. Okay. So there's no factor that's exactly 1, but the equations underlying it go through 1 at 760. That was the intent. Uh, buddy. Uh, yes, actually, my question is, uh, yeah, especially with the, the depth less than 30 meters that you had, and when you go to long periods, mm. I mean, I, and I was just thinking about the quarter length of wavelength mm. as a kind of a, not requirement, but a good measure for the depth over which we should average the velocity. Now, if you go to periods 10 to 20 seconds in yeah. BMPEs, yeah. how reliable is VS30 as a site? Right. So uh, this is a, something that always comes up. So the, the question is basically, how good is VS30 as a site parameter? For long periods. Uh, especially if you get to say shallow sites, long periods, stuff like that. And uh, boy, I've answered this question a lot of times over the years. Um, it's not a great site parameter. It's pretty much. You have to put it in context, you have to remember what we had before. What we had before was rock soil. Okay, so we, and we had these sharp boundaries as we went from one to the other. BS30 at least smooths that out. Can you have shallow uh, uh, soil over rock and another one with, say, relatively stiff soil but very deep and the same BS30? You can. And would the site responses be different for those two? They would. So. VS30 does not capture all the possible responses. A measuring of a shear wave velocity and calculating VS30 and plugging that into a GMP is not the same as doing a site-specific geotechnical analysis. But as compared to the other things we've got, it's the best we can do. That said, a lot of GMPEs are now, and from 2008, have depth parameters. So you can start to bring that in. And so if you see that shallow sites have, on average, lower long period spectral ordinates than deep sites, that can be corrected through that term. So the combination of the two seems to work pretty well. If somebody comes up with a practical alternative parameter that can be put into a site database and analyzed and it does better, then we'll put it in NGA West 3. I'm sure Yusuf will be very enthusiastic. <laughs> <laughs> Zifa. So, you know, after you included the uh, records from New Zealand and Japan, have you considered the impact of the equifaction on the site amplification? Um, not really. So, uh, we know that some of the sites that are in the site that are in the flat file did have liquefaction. For example, Imperial Valley, the uh, liquefaction array from 79, um, Port Island and Kobe, um, Treasure Island had some. So there's a few that we know had it and they're in there. We don't have a flag in the flat file that indicates liquefaction. Um, from a statistical point of view, uh, they're not going to have much influence because they're so small in number as compared to the overall thing. So basically what you're getting from the NGA GMPEs is you are getting ground motions that do not reflect the effects of liquefaction. And if you want to include the effects of liquefaction, you have to do site-specific. One last question. Um, one of the things that's been introduced, I noticed the, uh, the S sub S and S sub 1 factors are changing by 30% over decades or over one cycle. Your changes in E were uh, reductions by, I think, 50%. So um, sometimes the minority is right, and it would seem to me more logical to send both proposals to the PUC. And also a, consent, a true consensus is what everybody agrees to, so it would be useful to at least have that. I think, well, the PUC has actually seen an early version of the second proposal, so they've seen both, and they understand what the main reason for the differences are with the reference velocities. The, to be perfectly honest, uh, the, v, the reference velocity issue sucked all the oxygen out of the room for two and a half years. We talked about this over and over and over again, and I was disappointed by that in the sense, I mean, it's a worthy discussion and we had to have it, but the discussion we did not have in any significant depth was, 
Should we be conservatively bounding things for class E or for other classes for that matter? And if so, how should we do it? And, um, you know, we're having a public workshop, right? That's what this is. And I've been very honest and very frank about where our numbers come from. Uh, if people think, you know, you need to get those factors for E up and, you know, there's, I, I, we would be happy to, to entertain that, but for now, we're shooting for the median. We're trying to produce unbiased estimates of ground motion through the building code. If we want to deliberately bias things for one reason or another, and there could be legitimate reasons for doing that, then, then we'll uh, entertain it. But for now, we're shooting for unbiased. All right. That is really the last question. Go ahead. So when you move from the reference site to, say, C, D, or E, are you using the average velocity in that class, or are you calculating the average factor in that class? Yeah, good question. I kind of glossed over that. So where, where did the velocities come from that we used to compute the side factors in the categories? That's basically the question. So uh, we actually did it a couple different ways. So for historical reasons, we used the same velocities they used in 92, which I think are pretty close to halfway in between in a log sense. Uh, we also took this huge database that we have um, from NGA West 2 site database, and we have, let's say, um, you know, just to put a number, let's say we have 600 Class D sites, right? 600 sites that are between 180 and 360. We can actually look at the histogram and see, well, where on, what is the central value of VS30 for that? And um, so we did that too. And the numbers are actually not that different. And they're not different enough that the, the factors would change beyond, um, beyond the, um, the second, or at least beyond the first decimal point. So we feel pretty comfortable that we've got a, a stable number. But more or less, it's central values in a log sense within the range. All right. Thank you very much, John. I appreciate that. Yep. That was very important. Uh